Welcome to ATCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Yeah. Uh, 19-year-old female presented to ER with complaints of fever, abdominal pain and vomiting for the past two days. Initial 10-second assessment, airway patent with no pooling of secretion, gurgling, sound or strider, able to complete full sentence, breathing, respiratory rate of 20 per minute, saturation of 99% in room air, mm. on auscultation bilateral air entry present, circulation, heart rate is 100 per minute, BP of 110-70, uh, MMHG, all peripheral pulses palpable, disability GC is 15 by 15, uh, pupils are equal uh, and bilaterally reactive to light, exposure temperature of 99.5 degree Fahrenheit and GRBS of 120 uh, mg per dl. So, sample history, 19 year old female, uh, uh, complaints of pain score, pain, uh, pain score uh, 6 by 10, mm. already took paracetamol. Okay. Complain of uh, fever, mm. uh, abdominal pain, vomiting into mm. two days. Mm. Pain was initially peri umbilical, then mm. progresses to involve right lower quadrant, mm. uh, not associated with foot. No history of dysuria or loose tools. Uh, then no similar uh, complaints in the past present. Mm. Uh, the LMP of the patient was two weeks back prior mm. to the episode. Mm. Mm. So on examination, patient was conscious oriented, no pallor, ictus, clubbing. Go to the GA system. Uh, uh, on per abdomen inspe on inspection, no, dis uh, no distension or scarring, no pulsation or peristalsis. Palpation soft tenderness present in the right iliac fossa. Soft tenderness. Pal pal on palpation, mm. abdomen is soft. Mm. Tenderness present on the right iliac. Will you say when tenderness is there, you will say abdomen is soft? Uh, uh, ah, okay, fine. So tenderness in the right iliac fossa. Okay, okay, then. No organomegaly, uh, auscultation, mm. bowel sounds present. Okay, so I wanted to know certain, when you say tenderness, three things also should simultaneously be said. What are the three things? Guarding, rigidity, rigidity yeah. rebound yeah. tenderness. Yeah. So these are the three most important signs. Mm. What is the significance when you have guarding, rigidity and rebound tenderness? We have to suspect peritonitis. So that's a peritonitis, signs are there or not. That is the no, only thing. No, no evidence of peritonitis uh, clinically. clinically. So uh, a young girl has come with acute abdominal pain to the emergency room with a right iliac fossa tenderness. It's, so what will be your common differentials that you will keep? Uh, right iliac fossa, most common appendicitis, then mm. ovarian torsion. Mm. I, ectopic pregnancy. Mm -hmm. uh, then, then I'll think UTA is the first differential diagnosis. Female, 19 year old, the most common will be an urinary tract infection. Appendicitis, I am not denying the fact appendicitis is not that. Since you said there is a right iliac fossa tenderness, UTA also can have diffuse lower abdominal tenderness. So, the most common thing will be an acute uh, urinary tract infection. Multiple episode of fever, vomiting. So that is the first differential that you need to keep. I am not saying appendicitis is not there. Then next will be an ovarian pathologies, uh, a torsion ovary. But again, fever don't link with uh, ovarian torsion. Ectopic pregnancy, any childbearing age, irrespective of like two weeks since from the menstrual period, may be less likely. So uh, we need to ask whether she don't have any PCOS, whether there was a proper uh, menstruation that has happened two weeks back. So, all those things you need to ask. Uh, but the problem here when you are asking a menstrual history, ask a proper menstrual history. So, that is what I have learnt. Because many a times the patient will say that just a spotting for one or two days, they will think that it is a normal period. So, you have to ask that the proper flow, how many days she had. Because one more thing what we need to keep in your mind can be an what can be that spotting? It can be an implantation bleed. So, those things you need to be very specific. So, unless and until you are asking it very specifically, then only the patient will give you that history. So, because I had burned my hand by hearing an history from the patient. So, that's the reason why I am telling you, you have to be specifically asking the proper menstrual history. Menstrual history, not just LMP. Uh, so, that part is what I have to emphasize upon. Then, the next important thing, uh, what we need to, as you said, it can be an appendicitis, it can be an UTI, it can be an ovarian pathology. Any of these things can be there. Our idea will be to treat the pain first. So, that will be the first thing. And she don't have any life-threatening signs or anything. She is otherwise stable. So, the most commonly what you use is the Alvarado scoring system. Mm, yes, sir. So, that has been an time-tested old scoring system. There are very newer updated uh, scoring system has come. There is something called as appendicitis inflammatory response score. 
American Association of, uh, I think, Surgeons and Trauma Surgeons together, they have come up with this scoring system. So, there are almost the same, but whatever be the key point, one thing what you need to consider is the McBurney's point tenderness. What is the significance of McBurney's point? Base of appendix or root okay. of appendix. It's a root of the appendix. See, the appendix can have different, different positions it can be a retrocecal appendix it can be a cecal or all those things can be there so whatever be the position of appendix the root of the appendix is your mcburney's point so that is the most important area that you need to test mcburney's point is the line joining uh, umbilicus and uh, anterior, anterior superior iliac spine and you need to divide into three, three parts quadrant. three quadrant, three lines you can split it and the it's the junction between medial two by third and lateral one by third, lateral one by third so that gives you the idea. So, McMurray's point tenderness is the most important one. And what will be the initial presentation? Right before right iliac fossa tenderness, what will be the initial presentation? Till the periambilical pain. For, then you have a right iliac Pantic fossa. So, that history will be something very classical that you will get in appendicitis. <laughs> because that dermatomal uh, similarity, we will get that history. If you ask for it, you will get it. The next thing, when somebody is having fever, vomiting, diarrhea with the right iliac fossa tenderness, our aim is to confirm the diagnosis. See, this is the point of time whether we need to say whether it's a complicated or an uncomplicated appendicitis. Only thing what we need to think whether it is complicated, it's an uncomplicated appendicitis. Water from the history you are saying giving me, I feel it's an uncomplicated appendicitis. So basically again we have got a severity grading. Like you have pancreatitis grading. Similarly for appendicitis also there is grading. From grade 1 to grade 5. When you have severe uh, peritonitis and all, it's grade 5. And grade 1, it is uncomplicated. Maybe I will put this patient as a grade 1 as of now. 2, 3, 4, the severity gradually increases. And grade 5 is with full bone peritonitis features. So, that is what, why that is very important. Previously, we used to do surgery for all cases of acute appendicitis. Now, there are certain criteria that you can look into. And maybe a grade 1, grade 2, even if it is complicated, it can be local complication. Maybe just an abscess formation or it can be a perforated appendix without peritonitis. So, all those things will come under grade 2, grade 3, grade 4 and grade 5 definitely emergent surgery is required. But the rest of these things depending upon the patient's condition, you can decide how to treat this. So, previously we were, we were saying that okay, you go ahead and do surgery, lap, call, lap appendicectomy or open appendicectomy was the pattern of treatment. But now if it is uncomplicated, we can manage with an IV antibiotics. So, uh, you just need to cover gram-negative organism. So, for here, again to say complicated and uncomplicated, we need a radiological investigation. So, radiological investigation of choice, again, it's ultrasound. Yes. Ultrasound is the only thing that is required, but you have any other diagnosis in your mind. Like, you have, uh, you want to think in terms of a mesenteric ischemia. So, you have another differential diagnosis in your mind, then only a CT is warranted. Otherwise, an ultrasound will be a more than enough investigation, radiological investigation to confirm an acute appendicitis and to look for local complications. So, local complications like 1, 2, 3. What are the local complications? Abscess. Abscess. Um, Appendicular mass, mass. Perforation. So, these are the three things. When perforation, it will go into uh, peritonitis. So, you have to look for the local complication and see. And also, a fecolith. The classical fecolith, you can visualize it in ultrasound. But when you have a dilemma in your mind or you uh, have another clinical suspicion, that is the time you go ahead and do a CT. So, definitely CT is not an investigation of choice for your uh, acute appendicitis. So, you have come across, you have had a patient who you suspected appendicitis, you had a pain management done, then you went ahead and do your investigations. You have UTA in your mind, go ahead with a urinary, uh, cal, uretric calculi. So, all those investigations you have done and then you have done, uh, go ahead and uh, yeah. got done a CT if it is required only, you have another diagnosis in your mind. Like we say in acute pancreatitis, we say that you have any other diagnosis, initial, this is what I am saying initially. Suppose you have got a patient who is coming to you, three days she has been treated but pain is not subsiding. That is not the classical history of appendicitis. When you are developing complications only you will have. But for this lady, Immediately, a CT is not warranted unless and until you have a differential diagnosis which has close mimic to an appendicitis. Unlikely, there is no fever history. 
but there is some tenderness. It's everything is not fitting into a classical acute appendicitis. Whichever scoring system you put, Alvarado or uh, acute inflammatory, ac uh, sorry, appendicitis inflammatory response score, whatever you put, it's not fitting into a classical appendicitis, then you have to go ahead and do a CT. Now the question arises, as I said, complicated and uncomplicated. Now we have to start off with the first set of uncomplicated. So this lady most probably an uncomplicated acute appendicitis. Better to keep them admitted in the hospital because at any point of time they can go in for an okay. complications like perforation and all those things. So keep them in hospital and start them on a gram negative antibiotic. So what antibiotic you can choose for? Uh, Cunilones. Uh, uh, Ciprofloxacin will be good enough or uh, cephalosporins. A ceftriaxone will be good enough. But when you look into the recommendation, whenever you are planning to treat a GI, there is an always a suggestion that you add an anaerobic coverage also. And metronidazole plus or minus. Standard guidelines don't say that. But when an Indian scenario, I am getting a patient, uh, I will definitely like to treat them with a metronidazole also. Where other uh, anaerobic infections are all very common in an Indian scenario. So, I will prefer to go ahead with an either with a metronidazole with a ceftriaxone -like combination or if you're using ceftriaxone sulbactam it has got some anaerobic coverage already so you need not add a metronidazole in that condition so you are giving a plain quinolone maybe a quinolone with a metrogel will be an ideal combination ceftriaxone -like with a quinolone but you are giving ceftriaxone sulbactam that will be more than enough so that is your antibiotic selection of choice keep them hydrate them very well uh, put them on uh, keep them maybe 12 hours you can keep them just NPO just to decrease the pain there is no other indication as such and why I want her 12 hours you know that immediately you want to take her for surgery you can take her that's the only reason why you are keeping them NPO in the initial 12 hours then later on uh, you evaluate the patient then you decide if the pain has subsided after usually after 24 to 48 hours there will be significant reduction in the pain so at that time you can decide converting into an oral antibiotic so Again, conversion into an oral antibiotic. So, it's very important to understand whenever you're converting an antibiotic from IV to oral, three things what you need to keep in your mind, whether you're giving oral antibiotics has got bioavailability. How much is the bioavailability? Whether which area that you wanted to cover. In this situation, it is the GI tract. So, GI tract, whether how much penetration will be there in the GI tract. So, bioavailability, which organs you want to cover and how will be the penetration. When you look into that, Oral cefiroxam is very good, reasonably good and oral quinolones excellent because they have got very good GI penetration and they will have excellent treatment options for that. So, you can give any of these drugs. But when we are treating a urinary tract infection, so when we have a scenario where we are changing from an IV antibiotic, blood culture has grown an IV antibiotic, will you be always forced to continue an IV antibiotic? But recent guidelines, they show that maybe after 5 to 7 days, you can convert to oral antibiotics. But these things should be covered. You are giving a drug where it does not have got good oral bioavailability and penetration is poor, then your treatment is not adequate. Maybe you are giving ceftriaxone, but you are converting into an oral cefiroxime. But oral cefiroxime don't have a good coverage uh, to the uh, target organism and as well as sensitivity will come. Okay, it is uh, sensitive to cefiroxime. You think, okay, but bioavailability might be poor. So, that situation you cannot, you need to continue IV. So, whenever you are converting, these questions should arise in your mind and then you take a call and uh, treat the patient. So, that is your uncomplicated appendicitis. Now, we have a complicated appendicitis. Complicated appendicitis, you can have an appendicular abscess, appendicular mass, perforation. Perforation is a surgical emergency. You need to treat them surgically. So, there is and peritonitis is out. So, you need to hydrate them. They will go into septic shock, peritonitis. So, fluid management, all those things is very, very crucial. But these group of patients where a appendicular abscess has formed, but they don't have very much features of a peritonitis. So, that is the time when we decide, okay, whether we need to treat them with a surgical option or whether anything else can be done. So, that is the time when the interventional radiology people, we can call them and we can put a pigtail and we have to drain the abscess. See, wherever there is an abscess, it needs to be drained, either surgically or via a pigtail. 
so that is the time you can think over okay can we put a pigtail and we have to drain an abscess so that is a difference in the treatment plan that has happened maybe the last 10 years of your management of your acute appendicitis so complicated uncomplicated uncomplicated i am saying that it's everyone doesn't need a surgery they also can be conservatively managed but whenever you feel that this patient is going into complications you need to drain the abscess without any doubt maybe a, a, a particular mass and all they might go into an abscess later on so we need to have a close follow-up and maybe a little bit longer time of giving iv antibiotics to that group of patients complicated final peritoneal immediately you have to take it for surgery now there are certain special scenarios that you need to be visit so one is pregnancy with acute appendicitis so pregnancy with acute appendicitis again you have diagnostic dilemmas so what test you want to order Definitely, it's an yeah, ultrasound. ultrasound. There is no doubt, ultrasound. But again, CT. Whether to go ahead with CT. See, first trimester is the time that you have organogenesis. So, if second trimester, if it is warranted, you wanted to get the CT done, if you have clinically relevant, you can go ahead with CT. Most common non-obstructive cause of an acute abdominal is acute appendicitis in a pregnant patient. So, that you have to be very clear. In that situation, maybe you can go ahead with an MRI. You have a diagnostic dilemma, you can go ahead with an MRI. But what evidences have been given, what will be the update? Pregnancy with acute appendicitis, they prefer to go ahead with a surgical option. Because the chance of recovery is much more faster. The hospital stay, everything is less when you are comparing with uh, a non-surgical uh, option. So, pregnancy with acute appendicitis, they still suggest that it's better to go ahead with a surgical option of a lab uh, appendicectomy so that is pregnancy with acute appendicitis next is you will have a lot of immunocompromised patients coming to the emergency room where they can have appendicitis so you might not think it is an appendicitis they will have vague presentations they will have some diffuse abdominal pain the classical mcburnis point and tenderness won't be there so but still it is one of the presentation that you need to think about an acute appendicitis can come with a vague different like a diffuse abdominal pain if they are immunocompromised. So, that is the next thing. Another thing that I want to tell you regarding the interval appendicectomy, which was very much relevant previously, you have to go ahead and after 4 to 6 weeks, let them come back and we will do an interval appendicectomy. That practice is not needed. So, that is out. Again, they have found out that there is no advantage in doing by an interval appendicectomy. The only thing is that they are getting very frequent appendicitis, maybe during that time. For a single episode of acute appendicitis, there is no need to come back and do an interval appendicitis. <coughs> but interval cholecystectomy, yes, it has to be done. Because uh, cholangitis and all those things for cholecystitis, yes. But for appendicitis, it is not needed. So, these are the most take-home messages. But as an ED physician, our thing it will be the challenging option will be an immunocompromised patient coming with an abdominal pain. Maybe that time is what ultrasound may not give you a clear picture. So, that is the time frame when you need to think about a CT to be taken. So, remember that an immunocompromised patient, elderly patient, they can have malignancy also related to appendix. So, uh, you have to be a little bit vigil and always remember appendicitis. Age group is not classical to have in an elderly age group. The classical will be age group is what? Less than 50 years. Less than, that will be the classical age group. But above, if you are having a patient, you might need a CT. Okay. So, that is the time frame, okay, a CT is reasonable to be taken. But otherwise, you have to, can do a uh, uh, ultrasound followed by a CT later on if it is inconclusive. So, that's in a nutshell what you should be knowing about appendicitis. Anything else that you want to add? Uh, I have missed, you can appendicitis, add. false mm. negative CT. False negative CTs then? Uh, then stump appendicitis. And Already you have underwent a surgery and they can come back with a stump appendicitis then. Yes. But the management, the key, what you need to remember, clinically complicated, uncomplicated, uncomplicated, you have these classification, how to manage them. Okay? Fine. Thank you. Thanks.